In July of 2020, SideFX launched the Hulai Challenge. Today we talk to the winners, Chris Rutledge, Peter Hazel, Moeen Sayed, and Stephen Bester. We talk about their work, their Hulai experience, and Houdini. This is HIP TV. Thank you so much for making the time to be here and really excited to be talking about you and your work and your creative process. What was Hulai? Hulai was a daily challenge where Houdini artists every single day would, pr would produce a, an image or an animation and side effects would guide that process by giving ideas, uh, certain ideas every single day um, of what the artist should create. I think it was very hard. I had a friend who was like up till 4 a.m. every morning. How did it affect your your work-life balance? I mean, how many extra hours a day did you guys have to to put in to do this challenge? Uh, I'll start with Steven. More than I was comfortable with. Um, it started out, uh, so I worked in the evenings because I work full time. So from about eight, I would, I would go and then uh, Around episode three or four, or what's that, day three or four, it was getting ridiculous. It was going to two, three, four, sometimes five in the morning, and that obviously affects your work life as well. Um, so I had to scale back and recover a little bit, but it was out of love as well. Like it was, it was just really enjoyable. Yeah, for I would assume for all of us, except for probably Peter, it pretty much ruined our lives for that month. But uh, yeah, it was a ton of fun. Um, I like really was just like, I'll just try this out. And then once you know, you're three or four days into it, you just got to keep going at that point. So I did a, an earth one, I did a really silly one for the, the second one wind. And then for the third one, uh, which was fire, I did like a little character thing, which was like, kind of the first time I'd done any kind of character rigging and animation in Houdini. And the cool thing about the challenge, I think, is that it really got me using like all of the tools in Houdini since we weren't allowed to like use other programs like Maya or whatever, like I would normally use for character stuff. I learned to do all my rigging and uh, character animation in Houdini. And I think that because of Ulai, um, I uh, basically like got comfortable enough with that stuff where I feel like I can pretty much cut Maya out of my personal workflow, at least now, and like just use Houdini for everything, which is really awesome. Uh, Moeen, what about you, work-life balance? Oh, yeah, the, I, I didn't balance that at all. You know, I did like day one, day two, and then I think like day three, I got a top three. I was like, ooh, okay, like, maybe I should, you know, put some more time into this. But then I had the terrible idea to also like document every day and put it on YouTube. Um, and so every day when I was finished with my like recording for the day, I also edited and then released a video. And eventually it just, it drove me crazy. <laughs> it was just- You had to keep going. Yeah, and I was, I was too deep in, you know, there was that, that commitment. I was like, nah, come back out now. Let me just, <laughs> let me just commit to this. But yeah, no, it was, it was lots of fun. Um, you know, every morning it was just trying not to have a breakdown. And then, um, yeah, you know, did that for a month. Loads of fun. What about Peter, you? You know, funny thing is I never intended to actually take part in it. I was quite busy working on a whole lot of other simulations for, for a client of mine. And then I saw Hulai coming up and I thought, no, okay, I don't have time for this because I had then work coming in and I wanted to finish the beer and I carried on. And I saw there was on the 27th, there was a, a luminance or something along those lines coming up and I thought ah, let's just enter it because I had just finished it then <laughs> and I just entered it and it just took off from there so and now I want to talk about like a little more individual work Steven let's watch your slow-mo <laughs> So when you were making this, were you just cracking up, making yourself laugh or? Every, every day was that. I think <laughs> um, the humor comes from things, the things that weren't planned. Uh, when you're dealing with simulation, especially humorous simulation like this and ragdolls, there's so many things that, that happen that you didn't plan that you couldn't have thought of that are just the best, especially on that roller coaster one. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 
when they went around a sharp corner, everything just bugged out and they flew all over the place. And the one that I ended up with as the final thing was definitely not the funniest one to me. But the other thing with simulation is because it's, um, it's not procedural, it's not um, deterministic all the time, um, there's chances for things to change. And I could never get back to the one that I found the best, but you tweak it until you're happy with it. On the underwater one, they're full ragdolls and you can put, you can tell the ragdolls to aim to match a clip and it drives those bones by motors um, and puts forces in them to try match a clip. On that one, I only put motors on the, on the legs. So they were in a, in a walking motion. And I just love what it did to the top of the body. And it just had these arms flowing back and forth and uh, Paul was getting into a groove. And I love that. So there's definitely a little bit on everyone that that cracked me up just while making it, and uh, I think I think people also enjoyed watching the final thing as well. Chris, <laughs> yeah, this is a fun one. I mean, this kind of goes into a general question for you too. Like, how do you get your ideas? I mean, these are very interesting and distinctively Chris. I uh, think for this one specifically, the idea was really. Um, like, okay, it's a Houdini challenge. The theme is growth. Immediately, like when you think of Houdini and growth, you think of like differential growth, like tutorials and, you know, uh, Ian Farnsworth's recursive growth setup. And I was imagining just like, everyone's gonna be doing things like that. So how can I try to stand out? But yeah, for this one, I was just like, um, I don't know, I could do like a vellum, like a thing growing. And then I thought about these like growing dinosaurs that everyone remembers having like a, a thing growing in a glass that's gonna like constrain it just seemed like it would be kind of like a fun idea and a fun challenge. I mean, it was all really simple stuff that I had to model. It was just like the the dinosaur was the most complex part of that. And I got into this sort of flow with my other entries of modeling stuff by using curves that I would then like just draw with a draw curve soft. Sometimes I would like mirror them to make different limbs and stuff. And then I would convert those to VDBs and then like smooth that out and and uh, so that allowed me to like make stuff like the dinosaur or like a lot of my characters really, really quickly. Yeah, doing the, the spline to VDB workflow was a lot of fun. This, this one actually, this foot this footworking one, the speed entry, personally for me, I think is my favorite entry that I made for the whole competition. Um, even though it didn't win like a daily prize or anything, I'm definitely really proud of that one um, where I just like had extra legs sort of grow on my character as he's sort of running faster and faster. Um, but uh, yeah, there's just like, there's tons of potential in Houdini, I think, for character stuff. And I'm hoping that with uh, the new announcement of 18.5, with the new SOPS level rigging tool, that we'll see more and more people using Houdini for character stuff. Moeen, how did you come up with feathers? That was just incredible. Just the, the stare. I mean, you really feel that. So the thing is, um, I'd seen this before somewhere um, like some wildlife photographer had taken pictures kind of similar to this and I was like man that's that's a cool looking owl <laughs> when it came to the feather entry I thought you know what will have a lot of impact that won't require simulation started looking into these a bit further and I thought this could be a really cool shot the only thing is the head I just modeled the head some eyes and then I started layering on feathers and that was the other thing it was that I didn't have to do any sort of fancy modeling or anything right. it was just a pull shape and then just I just rendered it in redshift that was kind of the inspiration behind it I just like owls I like owls too I particularly like this frizz here that's kind of intertwined with this kind of orderly patterning yeah. it's very very good attention to detail so the cool thing with the hair system was that I could use just basic Houdini hair systems for like that soft, um, fluffy feathers. And they're not actually feathers, those ones like around the eyes and around the beak. It's actually just frizzy hair, you know, like a really high frequency frizz on just some short hairs. And then you use that as like a base layer and then you add short feathers over that. And then you add some long feathers to basically cover the thing and then you know, just paint in little areas where you want the focus to be drawn, like the areas around the eyes, painted that in as well, and then generated that. So it's kind of like layered systems. It looks like I had great attention to detail, but it's mostly just 
you know, that's how it ended up once the system ran. This one also is quite nice and I can see the designer in you. <laughs> Um, so this one, you know, is coming to the end and I was thinking, you know, what can I do to really just close it off? You know, like a, a farewell to Hulai. Uh, maybe let me revisit the ones that were well received. And so then I kind of came up with a little thing where I can just draw some lines onto a plane and then it converts it into like a incandescent filament type thing. And then it was just about cool camera moves and, you know, depth of field and things. So, Peter, now you mentioned a little bit already about this piece, which is just so fantastic. You said also you had already been working on this or had this idea to work on this. Why beer? I, I like uh, challenging myself. And, you know, I noticed there hasn't been or couldn't find a lot of satisfying beer simulations specifically. Uh, when you're dealing with this, and there's a lot going on here, I mean, you know, even the bubbles on the outside of the glass, and those are all separate elements. The similarities between, say, pouring an espresso and this is that the espresso also has foam on top. It's the coffee, and then basically it's just very, very fine foam that then ends up floating on top. And when you're looking at it through a glass, as it pours in, you get this clouding on the inside of the tiny, tiny bubbles, and it looks like cloud, and they slowly rise up top and then you start getting that fine line, very straight division between the foam as the foam floats on top of the, the coffee, uh, which is basically the same with the beer, except the beer, the bubbles are coarser, they're not as fine, you know. And um, so I used a lot of the development that I made to get all the coffee simulations. And then I thought, okay, I have enough knowledge now, I can tackle the beer. And that's what I did. And the addition was a whole range of bubbles in the foam. And to then modify the setup so that I could actually use flips particles for the foam. And I could have used flips particles for the bubbles inside the beer, which would have been sufficient, but after the simulation, you, you know, there, was, there wasn't sufficient control over how they move, you know. And I wanted to get more control over how many I use, how fast, you know, how do they spread out and that. And, but, you know, with the information you get from the simulator, from, from, from Flip, you can very easily then set up a Pyrus and uh, from that you can then very easily use to, uh, to evict particles to, you know, to get that motion. It is, it is very difficult, even once you've got a good sim, to then actually render it in such a way that it looks appetizing. Yeah, and that goes for anything, whether you're simulating chocolate or cream or... Uh, we had our fair share of problems with the coffee, you know, with the with crema to not make it look sort of odd. <laughs> you know, you want it to look real in a way. And those are complicated, complex purposes. You know, they, you know there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of texture going on. There's a lot of uh, subsurface scattering, you know. Uh, uh, and I have to admit, I had my fair share of issues with the foam uh, with regards to the subsurface scattering because I was using Redshift. And Redshift is, I, I don't know, maybe I, I just haven't worked it out yet, but I, I never really get satisfying results where I think, okay, this now looks real. So I cheated it. You know, I came up with, what I did is I filled the whole foam with a volume. And, you know, I did it like that then, so. I have a, a question for, for anybody who wants to grab it. Did you ever compare yourself to others? And um, how did you get over the fear? So obviously, I think we all compared ourselves to others as soon as people started posting on, on the forums. And you get to see some, uh, some really amazing work that, that someone else did. Um, for me personally, I think I, I got over that by telling myself um, it is a personal challenge more than a community one. You're, you're really challenging yourself more than anyone else. And um, I decided to, to take all the themes and base them around crowd. So I wanted to do everything with agents um, just as a personal challenge and because that's what I was doing at work. And uh, that 
I suppose in a way made me stand out and made me not feel like I needed to compare to everyone else and also didn't render anything. Everything that I did was viewport captured and uh, that took me a lot further than I thought it would with the uh, motion, the flipbook motion blur and depth of field and the viewport fog that came with 18. Uh, it took me a lot further than I thought I could go because uh, I knew there was no chance that I was ever going to render all my things every day because I'd committed to doing stuff every day and uh, I ended up copping out at around day 20 or so. I, I didn't quite finish all the things properly but I made a sort of consolation uh, last 10 days just to get that swag bag <laughs> for posting every day. Yeah I think um, especially everyone contributing from all the different time zones and stuff like I would wake up in the morning and see like Paul Estevez like post some really cool render. I remember one day specifically for Translucent, which was the one that Peter did the, the beer for, um, that uh, I had an idea that I wanted to do like a translucent animal, like a, like a, a lizard. And then all, I woke up in the morning and I saw that that was basically what Paul had posted. I was like, damn, I have to change my thing now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, th there was lots of fun ways to kind of get ideas from the topics and thinking of like, all right, what other translucent animals could I, could I do? And I found like some really cool references on Google of like translucent fishes and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, definitely having the competition was uh, was really motivating. Just piggybacking off of what Christopher just mentioned. Um, it's kind of this whole thing of you see artists posting every day and you kind of follow along with what they're doing and it doesn't just become your personal, you know, adventure through the month. You're also tracking what the other guys are doing. And, you know, you kind of form an attachment to some of their art styles. Like, I really like Chris's things. And so, you know, I would check every day. I would see like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Even if it wasn't like um, a top three entry or whatever, I'd still check what he was doing on his profile. I'd be like, nah, that's cool. Um, and so then that kind of leads into like inspiration for your own things. Um, right. Like I made this, this little slug thing for one of the days. And that was kind of inspired by um, seeing Chris's um, stuff that he does with, um, I think it's vellum based, um, a lot of your things. And so I did something that was kind of femme based, um, also just driving movement with, um, you know, kind of a, a deform rather than actual animation. And so there was like, there were little things that you take from each artist, but yeah, it was, it was cool seeing what everyone was creating. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's kind of like an inspiration osmosis where you guys are fueling each other's ideas in, and um, riffing off of each other. Um, and speaking of fear, Moeen, you have a series called Houdini is not scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's at least what I tell people <laughs> so that they don't get scared of Houdini. But, you know, the thing is for a lot of people, they open the software, especially, I mean, beginners, um, they'll open up the software and they'll see the user interface and they'll see so much going on and they'll try to do something or they'll follow a tutorial and they'll just be like, whoa, this is way above my pay grade. Like this is out of my depth. But the thing is, it's kind of like Houdini can do pretty much anything. So when you kind of get into it, you don't know where to start. And so that's what I wanted to do with that series. It was mm -hmm. to show people, you don't have to be scared. You know, there's actually a very logical flow to how you would kind of pick up the software. You don't go straight in and do the complicated stuff. You start with the basics. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to show. Right. But of course, you know, when you get more advanced, it is kind of scary. There's a lot of, of, of things that are challenging and you might not know how to fix or debug. And then, yeah, you know, you, you don't know how to proceed from there a lot of the time. But, you know, that's part of the job. You sit for hours and try and figure out an issue. Um, and so, you know, you kind of get over that fear at least. Um, another thing about that is also that different people kind of find themselves inclined towards different parts of Houdini. Like for me, I found that I picked up Vex very easily, but I struggled with like um, Flip and Pyro. I didn't really understand that and I struggled with VDBs. Um, but then for somebody else, that might be really intuitive for them and they'll pick that up really quickly. But then, you know, coding is something that they'll just disregard and not want to touch. Um, and so I think it's also that element. It's what are you doing in Houdini that is scaring you? Because it might not be your particular style. How did the competition 
make you use Houdini in ways you've never used before? And, and going forward, you're going to kind of continue that. Um, for me, as I mentioned, the, the rigging and the animation stuff was stuff that I had always done in Maya usually before and like had moved that into Houdini finally. But then also like just not being able to really use any other programs other than Houdini. Um, I had never really played with uh, COPS before, which is the compositing context. Yeah, playing with those other kind of contexts that I don't use as much like COPS um, was uh, a lot of fun throughout the competition. There was one day for uh, Ancient where I like made a render that was like, um, it was a joke because it was like uh, ancient graphics where it was like really old school looking 3D stuff. Uh, and I just like used COPS to add in like um, chromatic aberration type stuff and like scan line effects and things like that. and. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was just like, you know, I was really impressed with like kind of the amount of stuff that you can actually do with that. And the fact that you can take textures and cops and generate them there and feed it directly into your renders. Like I ended up using it to make certain textures for my, my fish on Translucent that I could shade with without having to, you know, have any other program and not having to have any other dependencies outside of my, my Houdini file. Um, so yeah, definitely like just made me explore a lot, which was really awesome. Talking about COPS, because I also use it quite a lot. And I was thinking I've never used uh, programs like Substance or Substance Painter, but I can imagine that a lot of the tools in COPS uh, would allow you to do what people do in, 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 in Substance, you know, because of the node-based thing and, and, you know, and being able to, to feed it uh, straight into your shaders. Uh, that's actually something that um, we're working on for our most recent project, actually. Uh, my brother and I have been trying to figure it out. Um, it's, we were trying to figure out how you would kind of replicate a um, substance designer type thing where you use noises and things to procedurally generate textures. And it's actually really cool. Like, you can do so much with cops. Um, and then there's the whole option to just feed it straight into a texture. Like, you don't even have to output the texture. You can feed it straight from cops into your, your shader. What's also powerful with that is, is the ability to actually take 3D data, you know, like your 3D position uh, vectors into cops and then use them. You know, there they, they are ways I've, be, I've played around with that. So, you know, playing with donuts and that, where you can uh, do create very clever um, displacement mapping, uh, which which would be difficult just plainly on the shader level. You know, my my way that I used Houdini differently was it was my foray into um, simulations. More, I, I avoided it for a long time. The dotnet, the dreaded dotnet. Um, because I don't have the patience to, to really wait for simulations. So Pyro and Flip are not my friend, but I try to try to befriend them in this a little bit more. And also just the way that, that simulations in the Dopnet works is quite different to the way that SOPs work from top to bottom. Whereas Dopnet, you're building a, an environment and a, a relationship between the nodes that are going in there. And, um, it takes a bit of a different thinking pattern to to know what you're going to get out of that. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of experimentation. It gave me the, the chance to experiment with that and really figure out how that works. And I'll take that forward. I think now what I'd like to ask is some quick questions about the creative process. How do you guys work? Do you start with like lots of reference mood boards or do you or do ideas just kind of pop in your head or both? So a lot of the time, because I'm working with like my brother, I'll we'll, like bounce ideas off of each other. So although he couldn't like enter into Hulai because it's an individual thing, um, for Hulai, he would often come to me and he has a complete disregard for how difficult something is. He'll just like throw it out there. He'd come to me, he'd be like, okay, hear me out. And then he would go for like this crazy idea. And then I'd be like, uh, you know, maybe let's tone it down a bit. And then, you know, I would, go ahead and try and do that in Houdini. Um, but a lot of the stuff, it's kind of just like, it's just sitting and just bouncing ideas. I feel like Chris is the kind of guy who who does that. It's just like, he has this crazy thing. Here it is. But maybe he keeps um, it and doesn't tone it down. 
it now. Maybe he doesn't do it in Dawn at all. <laughs> Chris is just like the peak of let's do this. <laughs> but yeah, it only gets crazier as I'm as I'm working on it for sure. <laughs> But yeah, it's, 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 like, like a, it's, it's, a, it's like a playful process. It's almost like you have to be in a play mode, like like, a, like children. Yeah. 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 And uh, that way, yeah. opening yourself up to whatever comes your way. Um, whether it makes sense or not in the first instance, but, you know, sooner or later, something will come that will make sense. Very often, even for, um, for paid work, for commercial work, um, with me, I find the process is quite similar and I can spend a week on finding ideas or working out methods or trying to come up with some concept and not get anywhere. And then all of a sudden I'm in the shower and bam, there's always idea. in the shower, always in the always shower. Always, man. Something that I figured out like a couple of years ago when I was working on like my thesis project for school was that I feel like, um, you know, there's like the planning stage in the beginning or like if I'm making like a narrative short or whatever, like I'll make kind of like my animatic and like have everything planned out, have the script and all that stuff. But really for me, like as I'm working on it, the story is really like always, it's never set in stone. It's like always evolving. And I'll find that like when I am getting into those details and the shots and stuff, like I'll even like tweak like stuff in scenes at the last minute that will, you know, end up having some kind of uh, effect on the story and you know the effect it has is smaller and smaller usually as it goes on but like you know you're really you are always it always you know is plastic and is always sort of evolving throughout the process regardless of where you're at even if you're like you know editing it at the very end in premiere and you have it all comped and stuff like there's always stuff that you can change right I mean there's no way you can sit down and and plan an entire creative piece or yeah. film in one go yeah I think in Udini specifically it's also just playing with the nodes, just dropping them, connecting them and seeing what pops out. Because I tried to plan my hulai. I sat down with a text file and went each, every one. So, okay, fire. Well, it'll be funny if, if Louise does this and then he stands up and he gets hit and then drool and feathers and bones. But that's never quite the thing that you end up with at the end. Either you hit a technical hurdle and you're like, this is not going to happen in the time that I have remaining between the hours of midnight and six. But... Uh, you do manage to to find something in that process of balancing play and what's possible and yeah what's just fun as well and um, just that connecting nodes um, feel of houdini really makes it fun it stimulates the creative process yeah. too yeah and the the non-destructive nature of it i am terrible i never delete any of my nodes so they just kind of go off to the side and get copied and uh, yeah, they don't get cleaned up, especially for Hulai. And uh, I should have made more HDAs. That's another thing, I think. I, I had a lot of a lot of subnets to do very specific things, which I thought would only happen once or twice. Um, but you don't really think about um, wrapping up the tool set when you only have, you know, five hours left or something. But to know that you are going to use it, something like that in the future makes it really worthwhile to um, put some time into making a proper HDA, uh, I should have done that. How do you approach a problem you do not know how to solve? That's an interesting one. Yeah. Because um, it happens more often than I think people think. Because, I mean, let's, take, let's go back to the beer. I mean, there's a lot of issues, a lot of problems that I came across that once I'm sitting with it, I have no idea how to solve them. If it is a, a Houdini-related problem, I think my first impulse is to go onto the internet and do a research and see if someone else has had a similar problem or maybe the same problem, and if they have, have a solution. Yeah, definitely having the internet as a, as a tool. I don't think I could work without even just having a reference for, um, for VEX and things. Like it's, it's poss impossible to just remember even the order of things that happen for, for all those functions. There's a lot of Houdini communities, especially on Discord and Facebook. There's Houdini Artists, I think is the main one. So depending on how uh, how keen you are to ask, ask others for help before looking for it yourself, you can always go there. And I think it's just knowing your tool set. Uh, the more you've played around, the more you know what is possible. And if you haven't played with the tools, you, w you won't even know that um, that's a simple solution exists. Otherwise, you, you swear a lot and that generally <laughs> helps 
Um, you throw things and you drink and typically you'll find a solution in there somewhere. Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to, to ask people is definitely super helpful when you don't have any ideas, but I feel like one really cool thing about Houdini in particular is that, um, you can really think of everything on a very granular level of like, what tools do I have to solve this problem? I have, you know, points, I have polygons, I have voxels, I have, you know, vectors and gradients and sine distance functions and all this stuff. And like, if I'm just like looking at like, you know, if I'm like on a hike and I'm like looking at like a weird plant that I find or something, you know, I can like try to think of like, okay, like how would I build this with, you know, Houdini and like, you know, what would I do with a shader and what would I do with uh, BDBs and what would I do with this and that? And, you know, just like, as you get kind of more familiar with that stuff, um, and like how to use everything together and attributes and, you know, like just like the core of kind of like what all these tools are that are making up all of the three things that we're doing. You can really sort of like break things down a lot and, and figure things out that way. So I, I feel like I, I don't really necessarily like, I, I definitely in the beginning would always Google like, oh, how do I do like a waterfall sim in Houdini or whatever first thing. And now usually I feel like I'll like kind of try to see if I can take a stab at it before I ask anyone if, if I can figure out an idea for myself um, and then I'll ask people next or, or Google or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with Houdini, there's always a million ways to do things. So, uh, you know, it's maybe you can you can figure out your own way that people haven't done before to approach something that, you know, yeah. ends up working better or, or worse or differently or, or whatever. Interesting. Yeah. You stop thinking and... about the larger pieces together, sorry. And um, you start thinking about the, the data that makes it up, like like Chris says. So if you have a waterfall, you're not thinking about how to make waterfalls. It's more how do I drive the particles with the force to get to the the thing mm. I want. And uh, it's a much more granular granular level, like he says. And I think that's the biggest block that new people come into Houdini feel. They're used to dealing with high level concepts, but it's a steep learning curve. And when you get near the top. Um, it kind of clicks and you stop thinking in the same way and then you become a lot more um, useful somehow you can figure out your own problems like just from my perspective something that i always try and and get people to do because i'm kind of into the whole education side of houdini um but something that i picked up when i used to program um, i come from like a bit of a programming background but it's pseudocoding um, pseudocoding helps a lot. It's kind of breaking things down in logical English steps mm. instead of looking at the big problem. That's because it. often a big problem can be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but if you, you know, um, sort of cut it down into manageable chunks, it becomes a lot easier. Like instead of thinking, how do I do a waterfall? You do something like, uh, because, you know, to that, there's a whole bunch of things. There's the white water, there's motion, there's velocity, all of those things. Um, so like breaking it down into how do I manage my velocity vectors? How do I do this particular thing? How do I manage my colliders? What scale? All of those things. And then you, you slowly work through it. Like what comes first? What comes next? Um, and you know, you don't do your white water first. And that sort of thing really helps. Um, you can break things down a lot easier. And then big projects actually become lots of small projects. And small projects are easier to, you know, finish in a day. Um, and then you just piece them all together into your big project. And um, I find that helps a lot. What would you guys say to your past self, whether it's like when you started Hulai or when you started Houdini, either one? Oh my God. I would, if for, if for the beginning of Hulai, I would definitely say, uh, do your project like the night before instead of like doing it the same day and posting it at, at like right before midnight uh that would have been a game changer i think for me i had a brief encounter with houdini um in 2008 and i had just started freelancing at the time and i was living in vienna up till then i'd been using 3d max but then i switched to mac platform and i stuck you know maybe cinema 4d and i was exploring options and i looked at houdini you know you you open the program and you, you're overwhelmed with all these things and these options and you don't really understand the core concept. Um, just because it's not as intuitive as other software that I knew, I just dis discarded it very quickly or too soon. You know? And I think the advice that I would give looking back now is 
just be more patient, you know, just give it some time, take it step by step. Um, you know, the, I don't think one will ever learn the entirety of Kudini. It's just too vast. And at some stage you will specialize or you will um, uh, find your niche within it. Let it be, you know, fluid simulations or is it more crowd sims or is it more pyro or more uh, X related, you know. But definitely, uh, you know, give yourself time. Yeah, and don't don't uh, get mad at yourself if, you, if it takes a little while to to yeah. latch on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you learn one note per day, that's a lot. That's, <laughs> that's pretty It'll good. It'll take you a couple of years, probably. <laughs> Last question, everybody. What is your favorite node? <laughs> you had to attribute choose one. Random. Oh, attribute randomize, Peter. That's Wrangle. Wrangle. Attribute not randomize. Wrangle. No. Well, that's that. That's a little bit that's of a cop out, but yeah. Just, that's a cop yeah. Out, yeah. <laughs> Because I can basically rewrite a meaning in it. Yeah, you could do yeah. anything in it. So, but I suppose if that's the one you use the most, then... No, my, my recent favorite node is Max Size, which I recently discovered. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't known. I wish I'd known of it before. That's such a utility node. That, that's funny that that's your... Yes. your... <laughs> so mine, I think, would be after attribute wrangle resample um yeah. it's just it's fantastic it's yeah. because i know how much trouble i had with getting evenly spaced um, points on a line back using soft image and to have it here and it's fast and it works with multiple curves and then the new copy to points that's also really fast and kind of kills the whole copy stamping uh workflow for instancing multiple objects yeah i gotta i gotta go with steven on the resample node it's <laughs> It's just too good. It's too good. There's also the whole thing of just generating curve view. And for some reason, I'm obsessed with that. I use it for like everything. I use it for making graphs and like I use it for making, you know, like a spine or whatever it is. I just do weird things with curve view just because you can paper things and like run it into an attribute wrangler. It's just, it's nice. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I agree. I use yeah. curve view constantly, especially for coloring. You have that wonderful yeah, gradient yeah. for free. First thing I, I thought of was, um, vellum rest blend is kind of like one of my favorites right now because you can uh i i in the the demos that uh Marine and i and uh black pixel and some others did for siggraph um which i think might be online at some point uh we broke down our setups and i used the vellum rest blend for the dinosaur but um you can use it to like make all kinds of like uh geometry that is like kind of alive um and like you know animate like a uh, bend deformer on like a character and then like have the vellum rest blend to that and it will like you'll have like a character that just kind of like flops on its own which is a lot of fun for me but i think um thinking about it a little bit more my favorite node that i've uh used so much over the past uh year or so is probably the draw curve sop just because you can just generate so much crazy stuff with the draw curve stop in combination with other things. And one of my favorite tricks that I, I realized I could do is I could actually really easily make basically like 2D animation or frame by frame curve based animation by like drawing a curve and then drawing another curve to be like the next frame. And then just keep doing that like all on the same draw curve stop. And then you set each prim to be equal to the frame number uh and delete the other ones with a with a wrangle or whatever um and then you can even like use a modulo function to like loop that and you can make some really cool stuff that i haven't really seen a lot of other people do with uh, 3d programs but um yeah i mean this just i make all my characters with that now like it's just so uh nice to have uh the ability to just like freehand make so much geometry and then like you know do so much stuff with that data and you need to convert to vdbs or, or whatever so that's probably my favorite right now. That's great. So those are all great responses, you guys. Um, can't thank you enough for being part of this panel. Yeah, thank you. This was spectacular. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much for joining. And if you have a glass, cheers, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the invite.
Yeah, thank you. This was fun. Yeah. It was nice to meet all you guys, too. This is great. Yeah, it's really cool. Nice to meet you guys.